Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out. The kind that both employees and customers love and support. I had the great pleasure in this episode to be talking with Devon Reeves, who is the founder of the Vaughn Group in Atlanta, a hospitality consultancy specializing in travel market research, asset and operational management, as well as brand development for boutique hotels. She has an extensive experience from operation, brand to asset management. We talked about the pandemic and how it's impacted the hotel market in the US. Devon also gives some great example of how the progressive hotel operators have pivoted during the crisis. She gives her view on the next 12 to 18 months for the general market. She also gives some really, really strong advice to young people who are now entering this very difficult job market and how she's keeping herself in a good place mentally during this difficult period. Tune in and enjoy. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast. And we are in the middle of June now. We are moving uh, slightly uh, out of lockdown. Today's guest is actually the first guest we have from the hotel industry for a very long time. And I'm very excited that we're going to be talking a bit about the hotel industry, which probably uh, have had some coverage, but still there is still a lot of unknown for the hotel industry and the whole tourism sector, what it means when we, we start to reopen and travel. So that's one of the conversation we're going to have today with Devon and welcome to the the podcast Devon. Thank you so much for the welcome Michael. Thank you for having me. Just for for the listeners out there, we are connecting with somebody on the other side on the Atlantic over in Atlanta, the US. So it's early morning by you and and it's afternoon here. Thank you. I'm I'm happy to be on your podcast. I actually enjoy a lot of your episodes and this is my first actual international podcast. So I'm excited. Yeah, and I'm quite proud that I could be the one that was your first one there. For people that doesn't know who Devon is and what you're up to, could you give you like your elevator pitch to people from who you are, your background and, and what you're doing now? Oh, sure. Absolutely. So hello, everyone. My name is Devon Reeves. I was actually born in Philadelphia, but raised in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And my background is hospitality. I've been in the hospitality industry for close to 15 years now. I actually got my start in the hotel industry working as a front desk agent. I've done operations, feasibility studies, asset management, hotel development consulting. And about two years ago, I decided to take a leap of faith and become an entrepreneur. And I started my own consulting firm called The Vine Group where we focus on hotel consulting for new hotel owners if they want to acquire or develop a hotel. I've also written a book called Tidbits for the Pineapple Professional. It's a guide for hospitality professionals. And I recently launched a real estate fund for those who would like to invest in hotels or multifamily in the southeastern part of the United States. Great. And uh, what is the typical way you are helping people when you engage with them? So they, I want to start a new hotel. Do you have like a process of how you make sure that they have a successful start? Sure, sure. Two ways. I have a course, online course, where people can uh, sign up if they want to, you know, do it on their own pace. And I go over the acquisition process from the beginning to the end, meaning from actually, you know, where to find a hotel to purchase, to putting together your team, to the end, meaning closing your, your hotel or getting the keys. And I also offer one-on-one -on -one consultations where I help you develop your team or put your acquisition team together. I walk you through the process. I help underwrite and analyze or do investment analysis on your hotel. I help you as far as sourcing or selecting your, your operator management company, helping you finding the different members of your acquisition team. And if you need assistance with the transition of new hotel owner from the old hotel owner, I'm able to assist with that as well, putting together you know an asset management plan or putting together a new ownership investment strategy. So two ways, one-on-one. -on -one and I also offer online courses as well. And it's very interesting uh, after we got in touch and I looked a bit into doing an, uh, and it stroked me suddenly, there is actually a, a lot of smaller 
hotel owners and not all the big brands own need to run hotels. There's actually a lot of smaller operators that comes into this world, boutique hotels and so on. And it's very interesting to see that that a market coming back because running a hotel like running a restaurant is bloody hard work. Oh yeah, you know it. You know it from the restaurant industry. It's absolutely hard work. You know, a lot of hotels have restaurants in it. So that's just even double the work. You know what I mean? The hotel industry in the US, over 60% of the hotels are owned by small businesses. So a lot of people didn't even, you know, they don't even realize that. They think, you know, that the Marriott's and the Hyatt's and, you know, Hilton's of the world, they actually own the hotels, but actually they own less than about 3% of their hotels in their portfolio. A lot of the brands are management companies and they leave that up to individual owners, small businesses, REITs, private, you know, high net worth individuals, public funds or private funds, sovereign funds, a lot of different funds actually, or foreign sovereign funds own hotels in the United States. And as far as, you know, individuals, I have a, a passion to encourage more individuals to to purchase hotels and especially people of color. Currently right now, people of color or African-Americans own less than 2% of the hotels in the United States. So I definitely have a passion to increase that. I help anyone of all, you know, shades of color. I'm, I'm being in the education space. I actually just launched a webinar series with two of my friends in the hospitality industry. One is he's Latino. The other is um, African-American. And we actually launched a course or webinar series for the next generation of lodging. I'm considered a millennial. This webinar series is a platform for it was created by people who are under the age of, of 40. And we all, we have speakers who are under the age of 40. So we have different topics and discussions today, June 12th. So we're having a discussion on diversity. The topic is in, inclusion is a unicorn. So a lot of times in the United States, a lot of people talk about diversity, but we don't really talk about inclusion and, you know, what are the next steps and how we can actually change it and include everyone. Yeah. And and, and that's, you know, in, in the midst of uh, all the things going on, and right, especially right now in the US, this is a, an interesting because there's always been a conversation in the, the industry of it's restaurant or hotels. It's definitely something I worked with uh, in my career in HR before as well, where we talked about diversity first, and then we quite quickly found out is much more about inclusion than diversity, because it's about how do we actually bring the best team together, no matter backgrounds and colors and all that. What what I think is that interesting is, is because actually it's the same in the restaurant sector. Just coming back to the uh, the the amount of smaller restaurants, there's that's like eighty percent of you know restaurants in in general, but definitely here in the UK is smaller operators. And then you have all the big brands; they only twenty percent. But often what we hear about is the big boys playing out, but we forget there's a whole you know lifestyle industry maybe for some, and there's, there's so much passion in these small businesses. And it's just I've been in hotels around the world where there's been you know owner operator and it's just a very different experience i can remember my last one from austria when i was skiing like this family the whole family from the oldest member of the, the family to the youngest were working in this hotel and it was just an amazing experience all the touch points because there was there was such a special culture around it so yeah so it's super interesting but coming back to then to the uh investing in hotels is that a good business you are lured a bit to it because a lot of people will probably ask question hotels is that a good investment Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, real estate to me is always a great investment. And hotel is a type of real estate. It is an operating business. It's a commercial, it's an asset class in in commercial real estate. And so it's definitely a good investment. Hotels are are complex. You will find a lot of people who are, they possibly have real estate experience, but they not necessarily have hotel experience. And so, or they have investing experience and I have hotel experience. And so that's where you bring in your, your hotel experts. So even though you may know real estate, you may not know hotels and then you're bringing a hotel expert or you're bringing a strong operator who can manage the day-to-day operations. But typically, you know, with hotels, there's so many types of hotels. You have luxury hotels, you have boutique hotels. Going back to, you know, your your stay in Austria, it sounded like it was more boutique, more intimate, you know, more curated as far as creating a unique experience. You have your big box hotels right now with the hotel space in the United States. COVID took a major impact. You know, it it hurt a lot of hotels in the industry. I mean, a lot of hotels, we're not even sure if they're going to reopen. Some hotels are reopening. Some hotels that have to close their doors because, you know, with COVID shutting down and the impact of travel and groups, it took a, a, a huge toll as far as just with the lodging sector and employment. But one of the the, the stronger sectors 
that has actually been able to kind of, you know, coast the wave has been the limited in economy hotels and limited service for those who don't know. Those are hotels that don't have a food and beverage component. So it doesn't have a restaurant inside. So those hotels or hotels that, you know, more of like, a, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in the United States, like people do a lot of road trips. And sometimes if they need a place to stay overnight real quick, you know, on the interstate, they'll just hop off and, and stay at a hotel or something. And so those particular hotels are, are doing okay because it's just been a lot of travel, like a lot of trucking travel to transport a lot of the goods. Cause you know, it, a lot of people were just stocking up on a lot of goods. And so, I mean, people couldn't keep up. And so the trucking industry was actually, you know, performing pretty well, but they needed a place to stay. So those hotels were able to benefit from it. But as far as a good investment is definitely a good investment, but just like any real estate, it has highs and lows. Hotels are definitely impacted when there's a pandemic or a crisis or, or recession, because a lot of time, the first thing that people cut is travel. They cut the travel expense, but people always still need a place to stay. So it's not like we're hotels completely, you know, just closed down at every recession or, or downturn because today's pandemic is actually worse than the last recession. That was about 10 years ago because I was actually in school about 10 years ago. The graduating students, I really feel sorry for them because a lot of times, you know, they offer letters were probably rescinded, you know, because of the hotels or the lodging companies or hospitality industry that, you know, respective companies that they were looking to work for you know, they had to put it on hold. And it just reminded me how it was about 10 years ago during a recession that a lot of the companies, they just had to put a lot of the management training programs on hold, you know, because they just had no idea, you know, they couldn't forecast what was going to happen. But either way, it's still a good investment. Real estate is always, you can't go wrong with investing in real estate. My three things that I look at when investing in a hotel to make sure that it's a good deal, is it a good location? Uh, does it have a good operator and a good brand? Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, because again, it's a uh, you forget sometimes hotels is a, a very big real estate businesses. Um, yeah, I worked for McDonald's for years, and you know, there's no doubt about McDonald's is a great brand and burger business, but they also a great real estate business, and that's what what is built on. You also touched a bit on this pandemic. It is still it is is a dreadful journey around the world. And today there was like some numbers out about how the economy around the world is going to be hit in the different countries. And I saw the U.S. the largest economy economy in the world still, you expect to take about a 70% hit on your GDP in the, in the US. And I guess that will, in a way, put some challenges up for the hotel industry. Besides, you know, people are scared about, you know, the, the, the virus to travel and there will be restrictions. Well, how do you think that this all this that's happening right now impacts the whole hotel industry and, and the U.S. as a country? Well, definitely has a toll on the hotel industry, definitely has a toll in the country, even in the restaurant industry as well. But what I've been noticing, because they're starting the different states around the United States, around the country, they're lifting the restriction bans, meaning, you know, that you can go to different restaurants because we, we were under quarantine for like months, pretty much. And so a lot of the restaurants closed or you only could do to go or it was just a lot of restrictions in place. And so a lot of places are lifting them. And so some some areas are seeing a huge increase. Because people are just like, you know, I'm tired of being stuck in the house, especially people with kids. They're like, oh my goodness, I have to get out. I have to figure out what I'm going to do with these kids because I've been at home with them pretty much all day, every day. And so some restaurants and some hotels are seeing an increase. I was at a, a visiting a friend. She came to Atlanta to visit. For, for work as well. So it was like a kind of play work situation. She was staying at a local hotel in Atlanta and they had an indoor pool. I mean, it was so packed. You couldn't even see the pool because it was so many people in the pool, you know, which, which is good for a hotel that was probably at, you know, less than 10% occupancy for several months. Yeah, you know, so that's kind of like an uptick, but they're losing, still losing revenue. They may not have that restaurant open because a lot of times during this pandemic, it's actually even more expensive to keep it open because of, you know, different factors like, you know, labor. If you don't have anybody coming in, you know, you still have to have labor. You still have to keep the lights on. You have to still do so many, you know, factor things. So that's why a lot of times, a lot of these hotels, they just kind of put it on hold for several months. That, that was the only way they can mitigate expenses. But, you know, when I visit or, or go around Atlanta, 
you know, I'm seeing restaurants, you know, people are outside on the, the patio. Now it's definitely different because, you know, we have to enforce the, the six feet of social distancing, but people are getting out, you know, I'm seeing restaurants, they're having where you can, you know, take your liquor to go, you know, where, you know, six months ago you couldn't do it. So it's definitely changing and hotels are getting creative, you know, when it comes to, you know, cleaning the rooms, just enforcing that, you know, that we're sterilizing the rooms, you know, during a pandemic, I noticed a lot of hotels, they were, you know, if you needed a place to work to kind of leave home for a bit, they were offering hotel rooms. I'm noticing, you know, yeah, there's been like a lot of virtual, you know, conferences and a lot of virtual calls. I, I've never done so many Zoom calls in my life before. <laughs> I'm sure so many people People listening is like, oh my gosh, if we do another Zoom call, Google chat, you know, WebEx. And, but I've no, what I've noticed is that a lot of people are in hotel rooms. I have a, a one-year-old son and I have to find little places just to do my calls, uh, depending on the call. Uh, a lot of times he likes to join in on the call, but I've been noticing other people, they've been going to hotels to do their calls because that's how they're able to get their work done. You know, that's how they're able to get, you know, do calls or, or just to get a break. So hotels have definitely been, you know, creative when it comes to trying to just get any type of revenue share. I'm noticing hotels are still opening. Um, the construction phase has probably slowed down just a little bit, just a halt, because again, you know, with the lending and, and all as far as uh, what it will look like, the future, future outlook, because no one, no one in our lifetime has gone through this before. At least with the last recession, you kind of, if history repeats itself, but the last time it was a world pandemic like this, it was a hundred years ago. It is so interesting. This is my uh, my third tailspin of my age. I came out in a recession as well in two thousand. The the dot com boom. Okay, and it was not as as long as the the next one, the the two thousand and seven eight. But again, this is very different. And uh, my dad was uh, he experienced Second World War. He said he could feel. And I'm originally Danish, so Denmark is a very safe country. And if you can't find it on the map, that's okay. There's only five million inhabitants. He felt some of that. And he was a, a young child. He said, I can feel some of that uncertainty. You know, you feel unsafe. He called it the invisible enemy. What is gonna what is gonna happen here? But you're right. But no one, not even, you know, you know, people that has been through four recession or five recession. This is very different. Everybody, my my mentor, he is in his seventies and he says that. I don't have any answers to this. Besides, it potentially could be the biggest business opportunity of a lifetime. If you, if you look at the positive, but you go, again, you're right. This is a, a very different thing. We had a hotel operator on the, the podcast some time ago that talked a bit about different types of hotels that would be successful in the future. Is this a push to even more economy-driven hotels? You mentioned a bit economy hotels has been quite stable through this. Are you think they're going to have even more money market scale now you know the things you're on your road trips your your business trips gonna go economy are you think is that the way the hotel industry is gonna move out of this or you think there's something else that's gonna happen i think that this is definitely going to change how we do business meaning i definitely see an increase of virtual conferences which will have a toll on a lot of hotels that do a lot of group business. So they depend on those in-person conferences. So I can see hotels getting creative when it comes to, you know, bringing that group business back and making, you know, people feel safe. Because I think that's really the biggest issue is just people being safe and concerned because no one really, there's no vaccine, there's no cure. So, you know, it's kind of like, well, I don't know what to do with, with COVID. Like we kind of know what to do if someone has the flu or if someone has the cold. You know, even though there's no exact cure for it, you kind of, it's it's some type of remedies or stuff that you can do so that way you can overcome it. But a lot of times with this COVID, it just spirals out of control and there's now these new strands. So I think it's just a lot with the, the awareness and, and people are just concerned for their safety. But definitely where I see where hotels, I see an increase of probably, you know, independent hotels or boutique hotels smaller. So that way they don't have to depend so much on, on group. I see or ways that they can benefit from the virtual conferences, but I do see it coming back. I do see, you know, when I mean the hotel industry coming back, I definitely see it coming back because a lot of, you know, major, major conferences that have like 20,000 plus people, a lot of times you can't have virtual conferences because of security reasons. 
So I don't see that virtual conferences are going to take over and that there won't be any more in-person because you hospitality is a people is, is a people business. Virtual conference and just doing everything virtually takes away that people aspect of it. And now with this pandemic, I'm sure people want to see each other more than ever because they're tired of, you know, being in their own four walls and looking at their, you know, their friends and family that they see all the time. They want to see other people and network. So I'm very optimistic as far as with the hotel industry coming back. I see the limited service and economy service. I see more investors looking at those type of hotels more than before, which may hurt small business owners or individuals like myself who want to, that that's more economically sound to invest in those type of hotels because they're not as expensive, you know, as a $400 million hotel or a $100 million hotel, you know, you can get a hotel that's like $10 million or less. It's kind of hard when you're competing with a fund that can pay for it in cash. So I definitely can see the dynamics changing as far as what the investment strategy looks like. I see a lot of larger companies or larger funds investing more in the extended stay sector. I see probably a lot of companies, again, going into the limited service or hotels with no food and beverage. I don't think that we'll see a lot of new full service hotels going to construction or big box hotels going to construction. I think that there's going to be maybe a halt or some some consideration on that. Like, is it really needed? Because, you know, we're going more into a virtual space. So that's where I see the, the hotel industry going into. Yeah, and of course, it's a complex beast because there's, uh, you know, there's conferences and there's, uh, you know, I guess there's always a room for, for you know, boutique hotels and so on. But, you know, I, I guess the majority of uh, hotel stays are, are business without me knowing. I'm just guessing here. Is that true or is it uh, private people traveling? You mean right now? In, in general, where we normally how you would predict the hotel's um, income from? Well, it depends on the hotel. For instance, it depends on the location of the hotel. So I'll give you an example. The hotel that I used to work at, where I got my start at, was the Hyatt Regency Atlanta. The Hyatt Regency Atlanta is what you would consider a convention hotel. They have over 180,000 square feet of meeting space. They have 1,260 guest rooms. They have three towers, two towers of meeting space, pretty much, you know, underneath the guest rooms. So that particular hotel, they can have so many meetings. They can have so many types of guests. They can have your traveler who's visiting Atlanta. Let's say somebody's visiting from the UK and they want to stay in at Atlanta because they want to visit the aquarium, the world of Coca-Cola, you know, CNN, go to Centennial Olympic Park. You know, saying that the higher readers in Atlanta will be a perfect hotel to stay at because it's so close to all of the major attractions, right? That's one type of guest. So another type of guest, a guest who could also be traveling from the UK, who's going there for a business meeting. He cares nothing about, you know, visiting Atlanta or may not have enough time to visit Atlanta, but he's just, you know, he or she is just there in Atlanta, you know, for the business meeting. So that's another type of guest. You could even have a family reunion there. All of these different guests at the same hotel at the same time. So it depends on the type of, of hotel. So you can get, you know, that's, I guess that's a long answer to your question, but you can get a business traveler and a leisure traveler, but it just depends. Now, some hotels like a resort hotel, they only focus on more leisure. And if it is a business meeting, it's still more leisure, meaning they're not really there for, for business. So it just depends on the hotel, what they're target audiences. Yeah, and I guess again, resort hotels. It's going to be interesting to see if people, are, you know, maybe just hunger for some, if they can afford, of course, some time away, and they uh, will go to these far destinations and and and, and spoil themselves if they can afford it. I really see that the resorts hotels are coming back because I I live across the street from a golf course, and they've been busy every day during the pandemic. I have yet to see that golf course empty because uh, the only time I see it empty is when it's raining because people are just, they just want to get out the house. So I definitely see it. Like you said, if they can afford it, I'm sure hotels are putting together creative packages to get back, you know, so that way people can stay at their hotel. And, you know, a lot of hotels, they're, they're putting on hold so that way they can properly clean it and sanitize it. And so that way guests can feel comfortable to come back. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. You know, you, you mentioned uh, the how hotels have used uh, their rooms for meeting rooms. That was very interesting. I haven't heard about that, but I can see that that's a, a smart way to keep things going, even if it's small revenue. Is there other things hotels have done which is totally out of what you normally would do with your asset in this period of time? Because I guess no matter what, you cannot just close a hotel down because there's a property that needs to be kept an eye on and maintained and, and so on from an investment point of view. 
Like, what what else have they been up to? Hotels? What have you picked up? Besides the the guest rooms or using the guest rooms as meeting rooms, the food and beverage concepts or the food and beverage outlets, they're focusing more on to go. In Atlanta, you only could do to go. So just promoting that, you know, partnering with companies like Uber Eats or DoorDash, where some hotels probably didn't think to do it before because they didn't really have to. But now since they're not having any guests staying in the hotel, so they have to become creative when it comes to their food sourcing or their their options. Limited menus as far as in the restaurants and the hotels, like you only can order from X, Y, and Z. So probably their most profitable or more, even more famous pieces. As far as with the hotels, I'm seeing more and more, you know, with hotels with pools, you know, they're really targeting those families, Uh, you know, hey, get out of the house here. We have a pool for you, super sanitized. And they go into extreme measures to make sure that it's sanitized and it's properly clean. So that way people can bring their, their family out there, especially some hotels have like fire pits or like barbecues. And so different family members can actually just kind of have their own barbecue. Some cities you can't meet unless it's 10 people or less. So depending on on the baby showers, I've seen like, you know, virtual baby showers, but they'll have it at the hotel. So they only have like a limited number of people there. They have their, their gifts. So I'm just seeing just a lot of people just being creative and still touching, touching base with their clients who've canceled instead of saying, hey, don't cancel, but let's postpone until maybe next year or two years from now. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess that you will see much more creativity as we go forward. You, you touched a bit on something. I made a note you said about, you know, the people, the young people graduating and coming out to this environment after this recession. You wrote a book. And it's quite interesting. That book, when I had a look in it, is all about helping these young people be more fit for for the world they meet out there, the real world, the world away away from theory and uh, concepts. But you know, when the rubber hits the the road, as I say, I can remember still my first real day in a real job. That was a wake up call. I even though I've worked in part time jobs all my teenage years, and uh, but when I really got to uh, my first important job, it was suddenly a different pressure that was on. So. So, so your book, Titsbits for Emerging Pineapple Professional, what is that book about and how is that helping young professionals uh, when they come out? The book is more of a guide. So it just goes over the fundamentals. And actually, this book can be transferable to any business profession, but particularly designed for the hospitality professional. And so along with myself and my co-author, Dr. Daquan Smith, we pretty much, when we would speak to different students around the country, we both were getting the same questions, you know, like basic questions, like how do you find a mentor? To some people, it's like, duh, you do X, Y, Z. But some people really, they don't know. They don't know how to find a mentor. They don't know that there are scholarships available for them to go to school. You know, they don't know the importance of just business communications and how to structure an email. You know, they don't know that there are different sectors in the hospitality industry. A lot of people, they just think, oh, I can just work in hotel. Well, you can work in hotel, you can work in a restaurant, you can work in destination management, you know, you can work in finance, you can work in technology on a cruise line. I mean, hospitality is so broad and it touches in so many different industries. You can be in human resources, you can, you know, be an event planner, you can be a travel coordinator, you can be in marketing. And so this is really what this book is about, is just to get people just to open their eyes. And also, not only did we hear from students that they had a lot of questions as far as how to excel or even how to get a job in the hospitality industry, we've actually even heard from professionals who, you know, were pretty much complaining about the students that were recently graduated from college. Like, yeah, you know, they graduated with a 4.0, but they don't know the basic fundamentals. You know, a lot of times with jobs, you know, like you said, they want you to just hit the ground running pretty much, you know, on your first day. <laughs> so, you know, and for, for someone who isn't prepared and like you, you were mentioning about yourself, you know, you're pretty much doing part time and now you get to your first full time job. And first, not only you're trying to learn a job, but you're trying to, you know, prep yourself so that way you can move up in Excel, but you're still missing those fundamentals. And when you don't have a strong foundation, you know what happens, the house, you know, pretty much falls down if you don't have a strong foundation. So that's pretty much what this book is for, is for entry level professionals or hospitality students in college, even high school students, even high school students who wish to pursue a career in the hospitality industry. This book is definitely perfect, you know, for you all. 
That way you can build that strong foundation and know what to expect. That way, once you get to school, you kind of know what to expect a little bit and, and know what to prepare for. It's interesting. I had a conversation the other day, it was a lot of conversation with clients. We need to have a strategy for this. And at some point in that conversation, I said, well, I think, you know, it's, it's a bit like when you start in your first job, the strategy is to start doing things. And, and learn and move fast. And this is actually, we're all starting from scratch now. It's a clean slate. And there was a Herb Keller that said this. We have a strategic plan. It's called doing things. And, uh, you know, Southwest Airlines, which you probably know, uh, American, amazing American company. If you know don't know about it out there, check them out. They are incredible in what they're doing. And it's interesting. This is what it's going to be all about now. Uh, no matter what kind of level and how much experience you have, in principle, it doesn't matter in my world. Of course, it helps you when you have experience from a confidence point of view, if you're in the right place, but it's going to be all about the outcomes we create right now to, to come back and build in a way. We need we need hands on de- deck, as we say. I know from the data that we have young people listening in that's early in their career in the industry. What will your top advice be to them? Right now, they're probably thinking, what the hell is going on? I'm never going to get a job. I'm going to lose my job. What is your top advice to them? I would say stay optimistic because, yes, we're going through a pandemic, but we're going to come back stronger than ever. But you want to be ready. You know, so use this time instead of, you know, stressing, oh, my goodness, I don't know if I'm going to get a job or the company that I was going to work for. They took away my offer letter. Really focus on you know, building yourself or building your brand, your social media, respect the social media pages, you know, are they reflective of your brand? Do you have your resume ready? Do you have your virtual interviewing skills ready? Because a lot of the interviews are probably going to go more and more virtual. And so, you know, interviewing in person is completely different than interviewing, you know, virtually. So, you know, practice on Zoom or practice in front of your friends. So that way you can be ready. So use this time to get ready. Brush up on the skill. You know, you may decide that your whole life you wanted to work in a hotel. And next thing you know, you're like, I don't want to work in a hotel. I want to work on a cruise boat. Well, use this time to really learn about the cruise industry to see how you can get into the cruise industry. Because everything is about timing. I'm big on timing. Everything happens for a reason. You know, we were talking about it earlier, you know, flowing down the river. You can't plan where you're going to end up you know, on a river, it just flows, but at least you want to be ready. You want to be prepared. So that way, if something comes up, you're, you're ready and and, and you're prepared because no one knows, you know, how our journey ends. We don't. And everything changes. Like, you know, last year, I'm sure no one in the world predicted this. No one saw this coming like this. I've heard like different stories I've seen on documentaries that they knew something was coming and they knew it was going to be harder, you know, because of the the travel and everything and how we're so connected. But, you know, we had COVID-19 and then now in the United States, there's a lot of civil unrest going on with a lot of people protesting against, you know, brutality against African-Americans. The country was coming from recovery. And then now, you know, a lot of civil unrest. No one predicted this, I'm sure. <laughs> you no, know? no, no. Uh, if there's <laughs> anyone that's predicted that, they probably should have been president. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, no one predicted because I'm sure a lot of hotels and a lot of restaurants and a lot of businesses, you know, they either shut down, they had to close or they were actually getting ready to reopen. And depending on where they are in the country, I'm just talking about the United States, it's challenging for them to reopen because a lot of the civil unrest, you know, so where they were anticipating reopening and their budgeting and their forecasting and their projecting and that just budget, they just threw it out the window because there's so many different things that are going going on. And so the point that I'm trying to make is, is that, you know, when you are prepared as much as you can, doing a lot of research, it's been like these past three months, it's just so much content that has just been developed. I even, you know, a part of it, just putting out just a lot of different content, just hearing a lot of people's perspectives. Like I mentioned before, I created a, a webinar series with two of my good friends in the hospitality industry. It's based off the under 40 perspective in the hospitality industry. Because if you don't know your history, then it's definitely, you know, tend to repeat itself. And I'm a big history buff. So I've been, you know, studying a different, you know, histories. I'm starting to see a lot of things that happened before is happening now. So it's like, if happened before and it's happening again, so what can we do to correct this? 
and what can we do to change this and what that we can do to be more prepared for it. There's massive opportunities within this because there's a reset button. Actually, to the, the Mother Earth gave us a bit of a wake-up call saying, hello guys, uh, you're not treating me well. Now I'm just going to push my little, my orange button before I push the red button. That's it. And uh, I think it's time now to, uh, you know, really rethink how you do business, how you live your life, you know, uh, lots of connections of mine have used this period as well to you know, reflect about how the future is going to learn as you say there's lots of brilliant content out there that people can consume and actually get better and improve themselves again but again yeah if you can accept that thing that you just have to flow down the river you know you can't decide all the outcomes but you can decide as i always say how you play the game or you you play the way you navigate down the, the river as the best as you can you can do your best every day that's the only thing you can do the circle of influence as Stephen r coe calls it as well how do you see the immediate future right now happening over the next 12 months? What's going to happen in the in the hotel world? Are we going to see quick openings now where hotels are just going to open up or it's going to be staggered? What is it that's, that's going to happen from your point of view? From my point of view, I really think it's going to be staggered. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a lot of hesitancy as far as trying to you know, see what the industry is going to do. I think a lot of people are just going to play it safe. And I'm like, I don't know. So I'm going to wait until somebody else does something kind of thing. That's what I think is going to happen. Then you may have some, a whole bunch of risk takers who's like, you know, let's do something different. I'm not going to wait on, you know, what the other people are going to do. I'm just going to seize this opportunity because, again, everything is about timing. I definitely see a lot of new ideas coming. When I mean new ideas, we're probably going to see a lot of people who are not a part of the industry and they see an opportunity and they're going to come and try to help. I definitely will see with Airbnb, I think there may be a shift as far as maybe more people may go back to, I wouldn't say go back to hotels, but they may strongly consider, because some people are just like strictly just Airbnb. You know, my cousin, she's a world traveler. She loves traveling the world, but she only travels at Airbnb. She doesn't stay at a hotel. Me, when I went to London, I stayed at the Andaz, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, I'm, a, I'm a big hotel girl. I love staying at hotels. Sometimes people call me a hotel snob, but I love they, you know, particular brand. So, and the reason why I'm saying it about with Airbnb, because some people may not feel as comfortable staying in the Airbnb because they don't know if that person has sanitized their respective place as opposed to staying at a hotel, you know? And then now like where I am, I still can't find Lysol wipes. So <laughs> I'm still holding on to Lysol wipes that fortunately I, I bought in bulk from months ago. So if I go to a hotel, I wipe everything down, but this is for pre-COVID because I have a baby and I just, I just wipe everything down anyway. But, you know, when you have people who are traveling on their own, you know, post-COVID, they want to wipe everything down with Lysol wipes. Well, they can't find Lysol wipes. And so I, people may feel a little bit more comfortable or more secure staying at a hotel because they probably feel like that the hotel probably went to the next level to sanitize their room. So I've been seeing that. So I just, I'm interested to see what those numbers will look like with Airbnb compared to hotels post COVID, you know, especially with the travel. I wouldn't be surprised that there were going to be a, a lot more road trips because people just feel more comfortable traveling in their car as opposed to traveling, you know, on a plane. I'm going to go on a plane one day. I'm not going to say I'm never going to go back. I have a younger son, so I'm just looking at things a little differently. You know, I, I love to travel, so I'm definitely going to, you know, go back traveling again. But I'm just, again, like so many other people just being cautious just to see, you know, what happens. So with the next 12 months, I think it's just going to be a gradual, I just think it's just going to be like a slow coming back. But when it comes back, it's going to be strong because people are tired of being in the house. They want to travel, you know, with all this, they're stuck in the house. They see all this content. They, I'm pretty sure people, you know, have lists of all the places they want to go to once COVID goes, you know, goes away and travel industry is going to come back and come back stronger than ever. We want safety. We're in the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy needs right now. And then we need to build that up again. As an a, a, individual, that journey will be, be different. As you say, some people will be very comfortable jumping on a train or going into a restaurant now. But it's interesting with the Airbnb conversation because you've seen they already, there's things happening in, in Airbnb, which Airbnb really disrupted the hotel world oh, yeah. in a big way. You, you, of course, you can have Airbnb hosts 
that is really good at that. But again, how would they keep the consistency? That would be, you know, my my challenge if I had to book an Airbnb again. You know, I would think about it. It's a risk thing, you know, and it, it's very difficult for Airbnb, I guess, to to guarantee that all their hosts are totally on top of uh, operational procedures. Like a, a bigger hotel chain would be a professional operator because they right. have a they brand. Can, they can afford it. Yeah. You know, they budget it to bring in, you know, someone to professionally clean it, you know, but even hosts, Airbnb hosts may be hesitant. You know, I have a cousin of mine, she's an Airbnb host and she put a stop to it. She was like, no, nope, because she didn't want anybody in her house, you know, because she didn't know what they were bringing. She's a, a neat freak. So I know she, you know, she wipes everything down pretty much with with bleach and and water and vinegar and everything you can think of. And this is pre-COVID. But she was afraid with somebody coming in her house and it may be a strong possibility that they have it. So that's another thing to look at it, you know, when it comes to Airbnb. It's not just guests, you know, staying there, but some hosts may rethink how they want to open up their homes to other guests. Mm. Uh, yeah, I can. That, that's another dilemma I even even thought about. Yeah, of course, the host also have something they want to think about. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do it myself. I wouldn't even consider that as an mm-hmm. option right now yeah. with my my own property. What about yourself, Devon? How did, have you actually kept yourself mentally and on top of things? Or if you can be on top of things, you, we just said you can't be on top of things. You can't be in control. But how are you keeping yourself, you know, ready for whatever that is coming here in the rebuild period, as I call it? Actually, I've been taking this time to, I've been doing a lot of journaling and just, you know, it's just so much that's been going on. So I've just been doing a lot of journaling and just a lot of processing. I've been producing a lot of content surrounding the millennial perspective with my web series. I've been doing weekly webinar series. I've been doing weekly conversations with different people in the commercial real estate space. I've been noticing that a lot of people that they're hungry for learning, you know what I mean? Pretty much they were in the house. They wanted to use this time to either work on themselves you know, create a side hustle or something. So just been putting a lot of content out, just like I said, journaling. And I've been staying busy because like I said, I have a 16 month old. So he has definitely been keeping me busy during COVID. Mm, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. He actually learned how to walk during COVID. So it was, yeah, it was, he learned how to walk and climb down the stairs. That was pretty fun. But as far as just, you know, keeping myself immensely, just like I said, just a lot of journaling, listening to podcasts, just listening to a lot of, you know, different perspectives, especially with the COVID and then now a lot with the civil unrest, you know, just a lot of people want to be heard. So I've been listening to a lot of what people want to be heard. A lot of people wanted to participate by investing more in the Black or African-American community when it comes to their dollars and spending, you know, their funds on Black-owned products. So, you know, like I mentioned before about, you know, more African-Americans getting into hotel ownership. So that's just really what what I've been focusing on during this past several months. Keep on working on your passion, no matter what happens out there as well as what you're saying. It's really keeping you keeping you going. Absolutely. Yeah. Keeping me going. A lot of people, they don't realize how important it is to take care of your mental. So I'm really glad that you asked that question because a lot of people, they don't realize that it's, like I said, it's important to take care of that mental. So whatever you have to do to take care of yourself, to to be in the present, a lot of times people, they focus on the past or they focus on the future and they don't focus on the present. Because if you don't focus on the present, you can either get anxious or you can get depressed because you're focusing on the past or you're worried so much about the future. Oh my goodness, I got to... I'm so worried. I'm so worried. But just focus on right now. Focus on, you know, meditation is helpful. Reading is helpful. You know, sometimes people get so too busy and they literally just do not take a day for themselves. And it's okay. You know, it's okay to say no. It's okay to, you know, just take some time for yourself, even if it's 10 minutes a day, because you can't be your best self if, if you don't just take care of yourself. You know, you can't, if you're sleep deprived, if you're hungry, how can you really focus on being the best that you can be when your your stomach is growling, telling you to eat, you know? So you go to the dentist to take care of your teeth, you know, you take care of your, your kids, you know, you make sure this, you make sure all this other stuff is right and in order, but you really want to make sure that yourself is in order because you want to take care of your body. You know, my grandmother, she lived to be 92 years old. That's a pretty long time. She took care of herself and she, you know, she tried to really focus on the present so that way she can be the best that she can be. 
And I, I see the difference of people who don't take care of their bodies. Because if you don't take care of your body, you know, then your body won't take care of you. Yeah, and uh, I think that's where, uh, you know, it all starts, all personal or great leadership starts with leading yourself in a way and set a new standard. I totally agree on that. So uh, yeah, the mental health, it's it's a totally different conversation, but I think that's going to be a challenge in the hospitality as we come back, both because of the, the challenges of running businesses and the pressure that's going to be in the people being back in the business, people losing their jobs. Uh, and it's a bit like a second wave, you know, the mental health crisis. I almost call it the second wave of this recession. There's a financial and a health crisis right now unraveling but the back of that there comes probably the biggest mental health crisis we ever ever seen because yeah the the pressures are going to be so immense trying to get back so you're absolutely spot on you know taking care of yourself taking that time out is essential it is essential in the end of the podcast i always uh, like to end it off with that we have some like tangible top three advice you, you already gave a very good advice there around the, the mental health bit here what is your top three advice to leaders out there in the industry in hospitality what are the three things they should be doing right now they are some of them preparing for reopening some of them have reopen other don't know where they are very big challenges ahead what would your top three advice be for the knowledge you have today one take care of yourself take care of your mental self that's one two make a plan a year plan as far as post-covid and if covid will come back when I mean COVID come back, meaning an increase of more, more cases, because it's right now we're just, it's kind of pacing right now. There's predictions that it's going to be more spikes. So a part of your plan, is this going to happen again? So now you've already seen what has happened. So now prepare yourself for if this can come back or something worse. And the third thing would be for the students the students or, or people or entry level people in the industry and they're concerned about the health of the industry, I would take this time to really work on getting yourself ready. There's a lot of certifications out there. You know, really look back in your, your books if you just graduated to really just focus and understanding the fundamentals and understanding, you know, if you if you are horrible in Excel, then take the time to learn Excel. If you are horrible at writing, take the time to learn and practice writing. Like if you have this time on your hand, just use it to perfect it and to get better. So that way, when the job comes, you'll be able to take it and run and, and, and build your career. Yeah. And, and actually, it's super important what you says there, because many people would do something they feel easy, good about. Actually, take that frock. The mm -hmm. thing, you know, this. everybody knows what we are bad at. You know, we all have the things where we don't really drill. And uh, for myself, as one of them has been, you know, I, I'm, I like to do, you know, the 70, 80% of something. And then I, if I don't have somebody to leave it to, I'm going to be in a very bad place. Mm -hmm. So I've actually tried to tidy up all my loose ends. Yeah. Actually, because that's one thing. And actually try to improve some things that, you know, uh, all the details around I do in my business on in private life is the garden is my night mere thing it's just like takes over my life it's not something i enjoy but i've actually just tried to become better at it and again is it therapeutic for you yeah it's, it works really well because you're out in nature as well and, yeah, uh, and, the, yeah. and, the, and the weather has been beautiful up to now in the uk it's it's been raining this week but up to now you know so it's been good for me you're both mental and physically but again sometimes when you deal with these frogs you, you get something out of it you wouldn't expect you know if you don't like writing just writing you know 10 minutes every day That's it will be insane help. yeah insane how the compound of that makes you feel better in the end of it yeah that was some really good advice there Devon. i will finish off by wishing you all the power and energy you need to get through this period as well and thank you so much for for this conversation i think we got covered a lot and there was a lot of good nuggets in there for, for people to take away to help them wherever they are in the world and whatever situation they're in to to, to get better so so thank you very much for that devon Thank you so much, Michael. It's been a pleasure. I'm so glad that we were able to connect and this has been, been fun. Thank you, Devon, for some great advice here, especially for the young people, as well as for the experienced leaders. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, share, rate, or subscribe to one of our channels. 
If the subject around hotel operation interests you, I would recommend you also to visit our previous episodes. Episode 22, Hospitality's Proven Principles with Adam Knight and Episode 27, Taking Hotel Operations Online with Alexander Sachal. Thanks to Let's Talk Video Production for your support on the podcast. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our newsletter at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.